Hey, and welcome to the highlights of episode number 263 with myself and my husband, Nick Broadhurst. Some of my favorite parts of this episode were when we spoke about the best ways to discover your life's purpose, how to overcome self-sabotage, and when we shared the 10 most valuable, important life lessons ever. But there is so much more wisdom and inspiration that you get in the full episode. It is jam-packed and super juicy. So to listen to the full podcast and get all the info in the show notes, head on over to melissarambrosini.com forward slash 263 right now. Welcome back to another episode of Yin and Yang Q&A with myself and... Me. Yay! You guys love these episodes so much, which is why we thought we'd do one more before the year is out. All right, darling, let's dive in. We've got some life personal development type questions. And the first one is, how do you find your life's purpose and passion? They're different things, are they? Are they different things? Yeah, I think they're possibly different. So, We've spoken about this quite a bit. And for me personally, I always like the simplification of this down to what we all have the same purpose. And our purpose is to be of service because nothing feels quite as good as when you are not even helping others, but doing something to be of service. It could be smiling at someone, it could be being involved in a charity, it could be just doing something kind, a random act of kindness. It could be helping animals, cleaning up the beach. One of the things I love is cleaning up the beach, you know? So I think, first of all, if we can simplify this question by saying that, well, we all have the same purpose. We're all here to be of service. And how we do that, we do that through, hopefully, our passion, which is the other part of this question, right? Mm, I love that simplification of it. Your purpose is to be of service and you do that through your passion. So whether that's music for you or writing books for me or podcasting, Find the medium in which you can be of service. Might be pottery, it might be dancing, it might be creating art. Find those things that really light you up. You actually don't even really need to find them. You just need to dig deep within yourself and uncover them. Because sometimes as children, we get told that we can't make money from our art and we put our passions on the shelf up the top to collect dust. But I want you to get your passions down from that shelf, dust off the dust, and start to incorporate that into your life. Do those things that really light you up and then share that with the world and be of service through your passion. Next question. Do either of you struggle with self-sabotage? I definitely have in the past so strongly, really strongly. But then I learned how to master my mean girl because self-sabotage is just your mean girl. It is just your mean girl. So I literally learned how to master my mean girl and take myself through that three-step process. But I'm just trying to think, darling, do you know any examples recently where I've self-sabotaged? I don't feel like it's something that... I think spiritually there could be some things which... There may be some overcomplication of various things that sort of consume you a little bit. But that's not self-sabotage. That's like inquiry. Yeah, true. I don't see a lot for you. Not, no, not I don't no. feel like I, you for sure, are like the king of self-sabotage. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, I, fortunately and unfortunately, I over the years have gotten better and better at doing business. So it sort of means like James Colhern and I, who's the founder of FMTV and Food Matters, along with his wife, Laurentine Tenbosch, there is so much opportunity. He said, you can literally walk outside and trip over money if you want to, because there's so much opportunity out there if you just know how to grab it. And so we sort of perplexed why some people struggle with business or money, because it seems easy, right? But that's kind of a curse as well, because it just means you, I don't know, I get too many ideas and I start launching things and it's just becomes a massive distraction for my music. Mm. All right. The next question is from The Lazy Healthy. What are your 10 most valuable and important life lessons? 
Just a small question. That could be a whole Whoa. podcast. Why don't I do five that come to me quickly and you do five? Oh, okay. Okay, I'm just going to go meditate, be love as much as you can in as many situations as possible, and don't be too hard on yourself when you're not. Coming back to what I said before about advice to my 20-year-old self, whatever that thing is that you know you love so much, do it and trust yourself. Understand the role of the masculine and the feminine in all things, especially relationships within yourself and with other people and your love or your partner. My gosh, so important. And I think that's four. And the fifth would be play. Like play as much as possible. My relationship with my son Leo, Melissa's bonus son, completely shifted when I had this, again, actually prompted by James Colhoun. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. It completely shifted our relationship because I decided to totally embrace the playful side of parenting, which I've done an episode on on my podcast. So check out the playful side of parenting on the Nick Broadhurst Show. Melissa, what are your five? Number one, choose love. Choose love instead of fear. Number two, let go of control and surrender. Number three is expectations ruin relationships. Number four, if you want more love, you got to make it. So make lots of love. Yeah. And number five is, I don't know who said this, but would you rather be right or happy? And <laughs> I think that's a really nice little reminder that sometimes in relationships there's so much of I, I'm right and you're wrong, but let's just let it go and just be happy. Okay, so we've got another question. Does a 10-year age gap matter in a relationship? So we actually have an eight-year, seven and a half. We sort of say eight. It's easy to remember. Eight-year age gap between us and it's a complete non-event. Don't even think about it. I think if you think that a 10-year age gap will matter, then it will matter. It's the power that you give it. You know, I know some people who have a lot bigger age gaps than that, and they're really content. Just out of interest, given this is yin-yang, how many relationships have you seen where it's, you know, life partners, soulmates, where it's the other way around, and you've got the man who is younger by 10 or, or more years. I don't know any. Do you? No. Well, I know people who are in relationships like that. Oh, yeah. We know people who are in relationships like that, for sure. It's just super not common, right? Yeah. Really uncommon. Yeah. I wonder why that is. Yeah. I feel like... Is that because the, the, from the feminine, I'm not saying female, but from the feminine in terms of energy always seeking that security and stability. And maybe... And then there's maybe a perception that an older masculine, which is the masculine energy, not the male, because it could be same sex, two women or two men, same thing plays out, that they seek that in something older. I just wonder whether that's a thing. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But I think if you don't make it a thing, then it's not a thing. But if you do make it a thing, then it is a thing, you know? Okay, so Jesse Brewer has asked, how do you deal with your relationship when you're apart for longer? Different routines, focus, et cetera. Well, we spend sometimes two weeks apart, which is our absolute max. Frequently. So Yeah, frequently. During the school term, it's two weeks on, two weeks off for us. Which will change next year because we've done that this year and it sucked for me. Well, it's only changing because Leo's <laughs> going away for six months. So, and I'm going to go to Sydney a bit more. Okay. So, yeah, it's... It's it's work. Yeah. It's also beautiful. It's also beautiful. There's polarity, you know. It's, it's pretty fun. hard and, and then it's also beautiful because when we come back together, it's like we're newlyweds all over again and we have the best time ever. And, of course, I'm getting this super intense quality time with Leo. Yes. During very important years of his life. So even though... You know, I'm not with his mother anymore and I see him half the time. I actually get probably more quality time than any father I know who's actually with their kids all the time. Mm. And well, I know some who are actually get a lot of quality time. I shouldn't say that, but 
in general, I would say I have a lot of quality time with Leo because it's just usually us together. Yeah. But that's an amazing piece of polarity. Well, it has been this year. I think from the masculine perspective, and because I have so much happening in Sydney when I'm down there with Leo, like I'm doing daddy duties, like I'm cooking and cleaning and drop sport offs. and pick up and drop offs and, you know, like I'm doing my thing. And then by the time I go to the gym and, you know, do my work, like parents know what it's like, you know? So I'm sort of in that very masculine energy, like getting stuff done. Because during the day, I've got smaller windows, so I'm just smashing stuff out. So when I'm away, I don't tune into that as much as Melissa. Whereas Melissa's here twiddling her thumbs sort of in Noosa. <laughs> Not twiddling. Not twiddling her thumbs, but... <laughs> I don't have, like, you to look after or... No, but you might FaceTime me and you'd just be, like, on the couch having a nap in the afternoon. It's like, <laughs> I don't have time for that. Well, I do, but, you know, I have other things to do. So there's definitely challenges in it and it comes probably more from the feminine, I'd say. Yeah, and I think, you know, FaceTime is amazing. We would do we do daily FaceTimes at the same time. And this has been an experiment for us this year, which we've realized is not ideal. And next year I'm going to be going back to Sydney with Nick and then Leo goes away for six months. So for the first six months, I'll, you know, it won't be like that. So yeah, I think anyone who deals with long distance or time apart from your partner, you definitely have to schedule in FaceTimes. I think that's the best thing at the same time every day, if you can, just to check in. Yeah, we do lunch and dinner and 7.45 p.m. at night. Yeah, we do the same time. And then also like sending, you know, once a day we'll send a beautiful message to each other. Yeah. And so just little things like that, like sending a nice message or a photo or FaceTiming, you know, just thinking of you, those sorts of things. It makes such a difference to a long-distance relationship or time apart. And then I think as soon as you do come back together, reconnecting straight away. So like getting in the bedroom if you can and and making love. What kind of challenges do you meet in your relationship? Well, I feel like we've shared a yeah. few, but I think, you know, this year it's a challenge, but it's also been amazing. And that's being apart because it's been a challenge because you're not physically there, but then it's also been amazing because I feel like our relationship has just gone so much deeper this year. Oh, we were in a completely different space. I remember in January, we were not in a great place, actually. You know, we're just having one of those really down periods together. In fact, that was a time where I stepped in and intervened a little bit with you. Yeah. I remember in the bedroom, I can remember clearly. Yes, I remember that one. Yeah, what I, what I did. Um, not talking about sex and talking about intervention in, in the sense that I, I put my foot down and I basically like closed the door. Leo was home, so we're like, close the door. Like two hours. We had to have a conversation. Like two hour long conversation and I was just super firm. Like I was, this, like I literally was like, no more. Yeah, and we had a really beautiful crystal clear communication conversation, yeah, that went on for two hours and we got so much clarity. Yeah, heaps of clarity. Because mm. I think I wasn't saying things because I was afraid of the reaction and then I was just like, okay, well now, you know, not saying it's so bad that I, I have just got to say it. Yeah, and we both you know? got to express what we needed to express. And these these periods tend to only be like a month or so, but they can be pretty – like the normal ups and downs could be like a bad month or something. We've had longer periods of – like because of an intense thing, like it, we I had depression and you had Jess passing away and stuff like that. Yeah. Should we be balancing or going back to primal roles for good sex? I'm not totally clear on that question though. Are you clear on that? What's a primal role? I think what she means primal roles is like the man being in the masculine and the women being in the feminine. I'm not, I think that's what she means by that. Not totally clear, but just get, we can give you our perspective on that. Yeah. And that is we are in a heterosexual relationship. So we're only speaking from our experience. Yeah. And for, for a heterosexual relationship, I have a certain amount of masculine and feminine inside you. And when we show up to make love, that expresses itself in its own unique way. And what I witness is Melissa very much in her feminine. And what I witness for myself is me being fueled by witnessing that. So my masculine almost receives that as energy because, and I've done an episode on this, you can look up called conscious, how to become a conscious ejaculator. When the masculine conserves his energy during lovemaking, you actually end up just receiving all this energy from the feminine. And for me, it's like just charges my batteries up because I just feel kind of like, I don't know, I feel like Superman a little bit. <laughs> so not totally sure on that question, but I think 
that's how it plays out for us. It plays out differently for every single person. It's a very yes. personal question. And read open wide because we dive deep into totally. that. Well, I dive deep into that in that one. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question by the Tina Theory. Benefits that you've seen on a plant-based diet, how does it affect your social circles? So there's two questions there. We have seen loads of benefits from, I used to get these bumps on the backs of my arms. I know there's a term for them and I can't remember the term, but they have cleared up. Also, I used to get eczema on on my right hand and that has cleared up. For me, digestion has definitely gotten better. Is there any other benefits that I have had? Well, you're talking physical benefits. Let's be clear on that. Yeah, I'm talking physical. But but the thing for me is like I already had epic energy. I already had epic sleep. I feel like before you had to watch a bit more about what you ate. You're a bit more conscious of your starchy carbohydrates and those sorts of things when you had animal protein in your, in your diet because you were more prone to putting weight on in areas you didn't want to, like your legs, for example. Because I'm a pita kapha. Yeah. Um, listen to my Ayurveda series one and two, if you want to learn about Peter Kafavata, all the doshas and all the different Ayurvedic episodes on Melissa's show. I feel like now, like Melissa now, she's a demon for fruit. Like she's, she's like- I used to have fruit fear. Full on fruit fear. And she had her first mango the other day in like literally, I don't know how long, 20 years or something. <laughs> and she was like, oh my God, I can't believe how good this is. I'm like, I know, <laughs> I've been telling you. Okay, next question, Kate Lennon. What are your thoughts on alcohol consumption? So I've done a whole episode on this, episode number 197, on why and how I quit alcohol. So I have not had alcohol since 2010, October 2010. Not a sip, not even one sip. The reason being was I was in hospital and was very unwell and unhappy. And I decided to get healthy and happy again. And the first thing I did was cleaned up my diet and stopped drinking. And I have never felt better. I have never think about it. I do not care to have a drink. I, it's just not, does not even come into my thought process ever. It's really interesting. There's certain things that people defend strongly. Caffeine and alcohol are two of them. I can never give them a coffee. I can never give them a glass of wine. I'm sorry, but Alcohol's not good for you. It's just not. Can we just be honest? It's really not. If you want the polyphenols, have some freaking berries. Have some wild blueberries. It's seriously like, I mean, ask yourself why. Like, wh- this is not a judgment, by the way. Like, we are like heaps of our best friends. Just from a drink. health perspective, purely from a health perspective totally. only. Totally. And seriously, heaps of our best friends have a glass of organic red or something. And this is not a judgment. We do not judge anyone. But I just want you to know, like, do you know, like, what you're actually drinking? Like, are you turning around the labels? Like, are you eating all organic during the week and then on Friday night you're having a glass of something out and full of pesticides, full of crap? Roundup. Like, preservatives. There are so many preservatives in wine, full of so much stuff. And I just think, are you aware? And I just want to pose that question to you. We just want you to, you know, really think about and why, why are you doing, why are you drinking? Is it because you want to feel relaxed? Is it because you want confidence? Like for me, when I used to drink, it was for confidence. Like I would have to have drinks before I went out. So I had confidence to walk into a nightclub or walk into a bar or a restaurant. can't imagine you like that. No, seriously. So cute. Next question. What does a typical day of eating look like for both of you? We'll just, we've done so many episodes on this and just rattle off quickly. Yeah. You go first, I'll go first. You know, for me, I'll have a smoothie in the morning or oats and morning tea. I'll have a piece of fruit. For lunch, we have like veggies and roasted sweet potato and beetroot and pumpkin and maybe like quinoa or some beans and avocado and a beautiful dressing with tahini and some nuts and seeds and we make like right now it's summer in Australia and we're making these huge yummy like salad bowls with like just everything in it. They're so delicious. And then afternoon tea, I'll have fruit smoothie. Like a fruit smoothie. Or just fruit. Or just fruit. And then dinner's the same. Yeah. Tiny bit more detail. Melissa's gonna say no, but I'm gonna give you a bit more detail. Because people want detail, right? It helps 
I know when I was a bit lost, I wanted a bit more detail. So very quickly, I'll smash through it. Lemon water when we wake up in the morning. Half an hour later, celery juice. Meditation, yoga, all that sort of stuff. Breakfast. For me at the moment, I get half a cup of oats and I soak them overnight with dragon fruit, berries, a whole bunch of seasonal fruits, fresh ginger, cinnamon, and I just kind of mash it all together into this thing, put it in the fridge and it defrosts overnight. How good does it look, darling? That's my breakfast. Lunch, as Melissa said, we often just do some sort of starch, so it'd be sweet potato. Or beetroot, or pumpkin. Beetroot, pumpkin. We'll usually do legumes at lunch and, as you mentioned, like salad, sometimes cooked, sometimes raw. For me, it's mainly raw. My digestion prefers a little bit more cooked. It's funny because it should be the other way around, but I'm loving the raw. But to be honest, it's the spinach that I love. Spinach just feels so good in my body. I'm similar. I do an afternoon smoothie. I tend to put in some sort of plant-based, like whole food-based protein because I'm working out in the afternoons. I'm trialing at the moment watermelon seed protein. Heard of that? No. It's all one ingredient, watermelon seed protein. Just literally just taking the oil out of the watermelon seeds and it's just that. Pretty interesting. It's about as clean as you can get. And then dinner, yeah, we're sort of starting to swap over more to, as a protein source, more quinoa and millet and, and a different grain instead of having legumes twice a day. Nothing wrong with legumes. We're just switching it up. So Megan is mindful has asked, what do you do when you go out for dinner with people spontaneously, vegan, gluten-free, etc.? Well, we don't kind of do very many spontaneous dinners, really. We very, very... Very rarely eat out. Very rarely. When was the last time we ate out? In Melbourne, maybe? And that was yes. pretty, like, we'd already checked. So what we do, even if we are relatively spontaneous, we call the restaurant. I call and ask what oils they cook with because you do not want to be consuming seed oils or canola or... Yeah, sunflower, safflower, canola, grapeseed. Like, it's just not worth it. So... We just make sure that they're going to be using, they have an option to use clean oils where we're going because that's just something we don't want in our bodies. But we don't, we don't eat out. It's so often. rare. It's not a we problem. We have people at our house and we, we have picnics and dinners and potluck dinners with lots of our friends. So We prefer the food that we make. A lot of our friends are really- Great cooks. Yeah, they're incredible cooks, but they're also health conscious. And so we prefer to just have dinner parties. So we do that a few times a week, like maybe two two times a week. We'll have yeah, well, either people once. here or yeah. we'll go somewhere. And we love that And then so we have much. picnics and we, yeah, that for us is like way better than eating out and you're eating good quality and you know what you're getting. Okay. So we've got some more health slash wellness related questions. Healthy MD journey. What type of contraception do you use? So like we mentioned before, I have been charting since May 2011. I have a very regular cycle. So we follow the charting method. And also we have just been, just started using the daisy, which we'll link to in the show notes as well. Yeah, it's super cool. I can't really add to that. But you want to, you know, with contraception, Listen to my episodes with mm. Lara Bryden and Nat Gringudis. We will link to those in the show notes. It's really important. Like I was on the pill for so long and it caused all sorts of issues for me. So you really want to make sure that you're not putting anything in your body that's going to do harm later on. It's very, very important. If this is such a controversial topic, but, you know, what the pill does is it tricks your body. It tricks your body every month. How can that be good for your body? Nick, you were recently sick. What did you use to support your body like supplements and foods? I want to preface this by saying one thing. I don't think I was sick. I was having a healing reaction. I think this is really important because it shifts our perspective on when we don't feel well. Because sick is a very strong word. But our body's not sick. Our body's always doing its best. And a lot of people say, I'm sick. That's a powerful mantra. I am sick. Like, I Whoa. am sick. Whoa. So whenever Leo says, I'm sick, I'm like, no, you're not. You're just not feeling 100%. So we reframe it as not feeling 100% right now. 
And that's okay. So be careful because the universe is listening. Mm. And every time you say, I am sick, that's a powerful, powerful affirmation to send out to the universe. So before we jump into supplements and foods and things, let's just try a mantra. I trust my body, mind, soul, and spirit to keep me safe and well. Simple. Like replace that thought with that mantra. Uh, I find that really useful because it enables me to drop into trust with my beautiful temple, my body, my messenger, right? And replace the mantra, I'm sick too. I'm Either healing. that, I'm, I'm healing or, yeah. I trust my body. I trust my body. Just really be mindful of that, especially with your kids. So in terms of supplements and foods, it really depends on what's happening. I mean, I was going through a, a pretty serious, nasty gut infection and it could have come from, I swam in an area where there was a sewage contamination. I didn't know. It could have been that. It could have been from a piece of spinach that for some reason had some E. coli on it and I didn't wash it properly. It doesn't really matter. The point is that something funky got in there and really messed me up for a while. So I used essential oils like thyme, oregano, and clove, which I found really supportive. I also was putting drops of grapefruit seed extract in my water in the morning. That's just kind of like a sterilizer, really. It's what it does. It acts like a sterilizer. It goes through and just knocks out stuff. And I was taking acidophilus as well. Because acidophilus is one bacteria which acts as a sterilizer. All right. Emily wants to know, Melissa, what was the best tool that you've used to overcome PTSD? And that's specifically in relation to probably Jess passing away. Mm -hmm. Where I definitely had PTSD, I think for about two years. Yeah. And two things that really helped me through that was meditation and also TRE, trauma release exercise. It's a very easy thing that you can learn just on YouTube and it is incredible. So definitely look at that trauma release exercise. How to get your teeth so white? Well, I do coconut oil, oil pulling every morning. So organic coconut oil, a tablespoon of organic coconut oil in my mouth with a drop of peppermint oil. And I swish that around for however long, you know, I do it whilst I'm making my breakfast or I'm getting ready. Five, 10, just depends however long. And then once my breakfast is ready, I spit that out into the bin. Do you have a good co-parenting relationship with Leo's mother looking for some tips? Okay, so I think this is a question from Nicole. I think blended families are... Very common now. Yeah, it's very common, very common. I remember when I was in primary school, there was like one person in my class who had separated parents and it was like, wow, that was was very rare. And now it's so common. So I think... I will write a book on this one day, maybe after this one. I will write a book on parenting and co-parenting because I've learned so much. And I think there's two things that have really helped me. And that is that what happens in the other home, you just have to completely surrender and let go and trust that it is the child or the children's journey, you know, and that I can't make them wrong and me right. And we have to just trust that that child is on its own path and own journey. And I think respect is a huge thing. I think that is my number one tip is just respect for the other family and how they choose to do things because there's no right and no wrong. If we start saying they're wrong and I'm right, that's going to lead to suffering. Do we want to have children together? We definitely see maybe one or two children in the future, don't we? Yes, we do. Last question is, when is your TED Talk coming out and your interview on Eleanor Brower's podcast? I don't know when my interview with Eleanor Brower is coming out. You'll have to ask her. Just send her a message on Instagram and ask her. But my TED Talk should be out in February. To be honest, I am like, a little bit shocked at how long it's taking. <laughs> and it's got to go bit, through. It has to go through a lot of channels. It does. Well, firstly, it has to get edited, and then it has to get sent to TED, and then it has to get put up on the site, and yada yada yada. It's a process. I could so, do all those things in literally like ten minutes. I know. So I think it's more the approval thing. Yes. Yeah. And so I'm a little bit shocked that it's taking this long, but oh my gosh, don't worry. 
when my TED Talk is out, you will not miss it. I will be putting it on my social media or put it on my website so you will see it. And I'm so excited for you to see it. Oh my goodness. 